Hey everyone, this is Brayden from the Catechumen and welcome back to another video. Uh, happy Easter everyone. I took a short, well I guess not short, a, a month long break after uh, these last few videos. We hit 10,000 subscribers, which I'm still really hype about. And um, before that, we did like an hour and 30 minute long video uh, in response to Gavin Ortland. So we've been working on those huge videos and some more huge videos to come. And that's why um, I haven't been uploading as frequently. I'm really bad at that. I wanna do um, shorter videos so that I can get more frequent videos out there and we can keep the conversation going. Not that uh, quantity is better than quality, but but anyways, today um, I actually had a comment um, from a listener saying that I should react to a video posted by Redeem Zoomer. Now, if you don't know who Redeem Zoomer is, then you're probably not my age. Redeem Zoomer is uh, one of the most popular Gen Z uh, the theological YouTubers on YouTube. And uh, he has uh, a bunch of videos explaining uh, Christianity, different denominations and things of that nature. But he also has a series called Kingdom Craft. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But this commenter asked me to uh, go ahead and respond, or I guess he didn't technically asked me to respond, but he recommended a video to me where Redeem Zoomer tries to prove Sola Scriptura is true, and therefore, since Sola Scriptura is true, Protestantism is true, and um, he does this in his Kingdom Craft series, which Kingdom Craft is a, a series that he does on his channel where he plays Minecraft on his server and explains tough, really deep theological, philosophical topics like that. And so uh, I decided if I'm going to do a response video, I'm going to have to do a response video in kind. Okay, I, I can't just like sit here with all my bookshelves in the background and, oh, this is my intellectual response, like very formal and uh, PowerPoint and all that, uh, all that jazz. I can't do that because uh, Redeem Zoomer he is, he is actively playing Minecraft while he's speaking theology. You know, how does he do this? It's a challenge. And I, I think it would be unfair of me to not uh, respond in kind, to not respond while I'm doing the same thing he's doing. It'll make it a challenge for us. And maybe it'll be exciting and entertaining for you all as well. So if you're a follower of Redeem Zoomer coming from his channel, welcome to the channel. If you enjoy Catholic Protestant dialogue and, and Catholic apologetics and things of that nature, if you want to learn more about what the Catholic Church teaches, follow the catechumen because I intentionally make uh, my approach to explaining the Catholic faith and, and giving apologetic reasons for why we believe things as Catholics as approachable as possible to my pr Protestant background because I am a convert from Protestantism. So, Anyways, in, in uh, hopes of making this extremely accessible, uh, Redeem Zoomer if you're watching, Redeem Zoomer followers if you're watching, this is for you. This is dedicated for you. So if you enjoy this video, make sure to leave a thumbs up if you enjoy our content as a whole. Uh, make sure to consider uh, becoming a patron member where you get Patreon exclusive content um, and videos. My patron members know what's been happening for the past uh, few months and I've been giving them uh, a few updates here and there. But you also get Patreon exclusive uh, content such as the Come to Seminary with Me uh, series where I talk about my seminary work on occasion and uh, kind of give my two cents on the things that are happening uh, in that uh, realm. So if you do become a Patreon member, it is a monthly monetary donation that is automatically charged kind of like your Netflix service. But hey, it's it's supporting a young Catholic YouTuber who's trying to get into the apologetics realm. And so if you do enjoy this channel, consider donating, consider becoming a YouTube member because we actually have that on our channel now. Um, and so that, that's also another way to monetarily support the channel. And I'm looking to get some specific perks to YouTube members as well, besides just like the badge that you get in the comment section. So without further ado, since I don't have a, a massive server to play on like Redeem Zoomer, we're just going to create our own world. And we are going to call this world catechesis, uh, which is basically in instruction. I'm sure my fellow Catholics are uh, aware, uh, are, are familiar with the word catechesis. This is just where we get it from. This is the Greek word catechesis. Uh, and it's also where we get the word katechumenos, which is the catechumen. Uh, it comes from the verb katekeo, which means I teach. And so uh, a lot of a lot of nerdy stuff happened in this episode because we're going to be learning what our Protestant brother, Redeem Zoomer, has to say about Sola Scriptura. And uh, hey, if, if you guys like this, Maybe I'll make this a series. Um, I don't. I don't foresee this becoming a huge series. 
<laughs> but hey, if you guys like it, you know, it is what it is. And to reflect the importance and uh, the, the value and the gravity of these discussions theologically, uh, we are going to go ahead and shift the game mode to hardcore. If you don't know what hardcore is, it basically means if you die, you're done, the world's gone, and hey, we got to keep this world going. So um, it's 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 gonna it's gonna be difficult, but it's a difficult task talking about theology. So the gameplay should reflect that. All right, let's do this thing. All right, here is our world, and since we've spawned in, let's go ahead and listen to the first part of Redeem Zoomer's video. Make sure it's on regular speed. There we go. People who say you can't understand the Bible without church tradition make it sound like the church fathers are better at communicating than God. Should we respond to that? Maybe we will. Hey guys. Those who say that you need church tradition to understand the Bible uh, make it seem like the church fathers are better at communicating than God. Uh, here's here's a reason I disagree with that. The tradition that helps us interpret scripture is itself the word of God. So it's not like God's word is is incoherent without adding human traditions onto it. And it's not even really saying that God's word is incoherent because it is completely coherent, but the correct understanding is sufficiently uh, supplied by the tradition that God has handed down through the apostles to the church. Notice the assumption that God merely handed down his word in the written scriptures alone. As Catholics and uh, as, as pre-Protestant Christians, we deny that assumption and we would just say, hey, both sacred tradition and sacred scripture are uh, God's word, and they should be um, venerated as God's word equally. They might be God's word in different modes, uh, but that doesn't mean one is and one isn't God's word. Oops. Meant to start playing the video with that hot key. <laughs> Today we are talking about the belief that makes Protestants Protestant. The thing that sets us apart from all other Christian groups, whether Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox, we are talking about sola scriptura, which is Latin for the Bible alone. This doesn't mean that the Bible is our only authority. It does mean that the Bible is our only infallible authority, which means it's our highest authority that all other lesser authorities must submit to. There is no authority that is equal to or higher than the Bible because the Bible is the word of God. So as Catholics, um, we can agree in a general sense that the word of God is the supreme rule of faith. This is actually what the Vatican, Second Vatican Council uh, says, that uh, I think it's Dei Verbum says, that the word of God is the, the supreme rule of faith to which all rules must be in submission. The magisterium serves uh, the word of God. It is subservient to the word of God. It's not set over the word of God, but the magisterium, which is the teaching office of the church, rightly interprets the word of God. And so to say that all rules, all... Um, um, all ecclesial rules must be in submission to the word of God does not preclude that there are rules in the church that can act with an infallible authority, even though it's not at the same level of authority as the scriptures. God's word as inspired by the Holy Spirit as um, actually given as truth propositions by God to man is people like to say, ontologically unique and superior. You know, the, the debates about Sola Scriptura uh, and about the the uh, scriptures being ontologically unique in comparison to other rules, I, I affirm that. As Catholics, we affirm that God's word, written or unwritten, is ontologically unique and the um, supreme rule of faith. So I just wanted to kind of get that out there because a lot of people say... Um, Look, well, Scripture says in, in 1 Timothy that uh, all Scripture is, is God-breathed uh, or inspired, God-inspired, um, and, and profitable for teaching, for correcting, and the Scriptures don't teach that tra uh, tradition is inspired in the same way that uh, the, the, the written word is. But uh, that doesn't follow that uh, sacred tradition isn't inspired. It just depends on what you mean by inspired. If you believe by inspired, uh, that means that uh, the, the thing that is inspired is just directly revealed by God as his word, then we agree that sacred tradition 
is inspired, but the mode of passing down or handing on or the mode of inspiration is different than the mode of inspiration that is present uh, in in the word of uh, in in the written word of God in the scriptures. Because while in uh, the scriptures the Holy Spirit decided uh, the exact words to be inscripturated, like the very uh, mode, the very words to be written down on the page are it, are themselves asserted by the Holy Spirit. The same is not said for sacred tradition because it's a different mode. The, the, the mode of communicating sacred tradition is mutable while the sacred tradition, the substance of sacred tradition is immutable. It is unchangeable because it is God's word. That is what Sola Scriptura means. And I'm gonna give three reasons for why Sola Scriptura is true and why you should therefore be Protestant. Because if you believe in Sola Scriptura, then your ideas are Protestant. That's the one thing that sets Protestants apart from all other Christians. So reason number one is that religious authorities, even religious authorities ordained directly by God, still sin and go astray. Reason number two is that all of the arguments against Sola Scriptura could have been used by the Pharisees against our Lord Jesus himself. And reason number three is that everyone already implicitly believes in Sola Scriptura, even if they don't know it yet. Doubt. All, all three of those, uh, pre- uh, doubt, doubt. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that everyone already implicitly believes in Sola Scriptura unless you're defining it as very, very generally, as in the word of God is supreme above all things. But again, that would encapsulate uh, sacred tradition and that would not invalidate uh, post-apostolic, non-relevatory, infallible uh, rules such as uh, the definitions found in an ecumenical council. Uh, So yeah, I, I, I doubt that, and um, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get into it, but I'm, I'm sure that's just like a kind of introduction to the uh, arguments that he's going to be using, but I, I already doubt the, um, the approach that he's using simply because they begin on false premises. So, all right, let's go ahead and continue. So let's start with reason number one. You know, the reason I am Protestant The fundamental reason, even though there's many reasons, for example, I think Protestants have the best architecture and music. I know that given there's a lot of contemporary Protestant churches with terrible architecture and music, that can be hard to believe, but come on. J.S. Bach and Handel were both Protestant, I think way better composers than any Catholic religious composers. And, you know, before 1960, basically every Protestant church looked like this, looked like my Presbyterian church in Minecraft here. So it's a very new trend for new Protestant denominations to have bad aesthetics. So, yes, that is one of the reasons I like being Protestant. Yeah, so (laughs) one reason you enjoy being Protestant is because you enjoy the accidental characteristics of Protestant denominations. Now, I could say the same thing. Catholic literature, uh, the, the divine comedy, Catholic compositions, you think of Ave Maria, like the beauty found within the Catholic Church in the composition of music, the composition of literature, and even the architecture. My man, have you ever seen the Sistine Chapel? Have you ever seen uh, St. Peter's Basilica, St. Andrew's Basilica, St. John Lateran? Like literally any church, any Catholic church in Rome, all these very famous and grandiose and important churches are Catholic, at least Catholic or Orthodox. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I find that, I find that claim to be kind of suspicious. We need to go underground and start mining because (laughs) we're probably going to die if we stay out there. Okay. Uh, uh, let's go. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, you know, just even if, uh, Catholic architecture and literary composition and, uh, all those things weren't superior to Protestants, which arguably they are, um, that wouldn't mean that um, they are more true than Protestants. And so, yeah, I I hope he kind of points that out. That might be a reason why he enjoys being Protestant, but that's not an objective reason to be Protestant. 
but it is not the biggest reason at all. The biggest theological reason for why I am Protestant is because Protestants take sin the most seriously, especially the classical Reformation Protestant traditions, like the Lutheran tradition and the Reformed tradition. They have a very strong doctrine of original sin and total depravity. I would actually dispute that. Uh, in a lot of cases, the Catholic tradition takes sin far more seriously because uh, classical Protestants such as Lutherans and Presbyterians and things of that nature do not um, do not affirm the necessity of receiving grace within the sacrament of confession in order be, to be forgiven of mortal sins. Uh, there are sins in uh, the the Lutheran uh, denomination that are classified as mortal, and a lot of them over, overlap with what Catholics um, think of as mortal sins, but that does not indicate an automatic loss of salvation like it would in the Catholic faith. So there are uh, we, we take sin very, very seriously in the Catholic faith. And we continue to affirm what uh, John says when he says that there is a sin that leads to death. Traditionally, that has been understood as um, mortal versus venial sins. There are sins that we can commit that uh, will produce um, the the death of the soul and and the destruction of charity in our soul, which would mean that we are outside of uh, the the state of grace. We're outside of friendship with God, and we need to be redeemed again. And, and that's why we are commanded to confess our sins and so receive forgiveness again. And so there there are certain sins that we can commit that will uh, result in a loss of salvation. Unlike, uh, say, Presbyterianism uh, that that affirms the um, uh, automatic perseverance of the saints. If you are truly a Christian, if you are truly saved, then no matter what you do, you cannot lose your salvation. Now, there are different um, articulations of this. A lot of Presbyterians will say you're unable to live in perpetual unrepentant sin if you have true faith. Uh, so they say, and you are, um, the, the, the works, the good works that are produced by faith are produced automatically and infallibly and, uh, must come from faith. I hear a chicken out here. I need food. So I'm going to go ahead and get the, <laughs> get them. There we go. Okay. And so while, uh, Lutherans and Presbyterians might have a warped view of, say, concupiscence, which is the natural inclination to sin. Like I know in, in the Lutheran denomination, they believe that the inclination or the desire to sin, even when you don't uh, submit your will to it, even when you don't act on that desire, it is still a sin for you. And so they have a weird view of concupiscence, of original sin, that doesn't always line up with the historic Christian understanding of those things. Which means that sin affects absolutely every part of us. There is not a single part of us that is not sinful. I was recently doing a debate. Okay, so uh, sorry, I missed that last part, uh, but I think that's sort of a vague claim. We affirm that uh, man, by virtue of original sin, is completely deprived of justice and therefore does not deserve heaven. We are born naturally unworthy of heaven. Uh, that is just that's just the state of uh, humanity that we don't we naturally do not deserve heaven because we are deprived of original justice uh, that Adam and Eve had in the garden. But that doesn't mean that man is entirely depraved and incapable of being prepared to uh, receive justification and conversion uh, because there is a prevenient working of God uh, through things such as uh, his revelation and the preaching of the gospel to bring man to a saving knowledge of him. And so, um, yeah, the, the total inability, total depravity stuff, while we are depraved, while we cannot be just on our own, um, the, I think that takes the condition of man a little bit too far, although there are uh, some comparable um, and, and allowed understandings of that, such as in the Thomistic tradition. With a liberal gay affirming pastor, and he was like, have you ever considered what it's like to be queer and be told that a part of you is sinful? And I was like, dude, Every part of me is sinful. I'm a Calvinist. I believe in um, I believe in total depravity. That's a very Protestant idea that sin affects everything. And if sin affects everything, then sin also affects the church. And if sin affects the church, 
then that means the church is not infallible. The so that's a non sequitur. Um, that that the, the, the conclusion that the church isn't infallible does not follow from the premise that the church is sinful. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. People, individual people are fallible. And even the church, you know, the church is fallible, but that doesn't mean that it can't act infallibly. So there's a distinction between being inherently fallible or infallible and having the capacity to act infallibly. So no human being has the uh, inherent ability to be infallible or no human being is always infallible no matter what. Uh, we, we are sinful, but we are just, uh, we have limited knowledge and we have uh, limited um, capabilities as human beings. Only God alone uh, naturally, intrinsically is infallible. And so what that means is because God is intrinsically infallible, he has the capacity to impart a charism of infallibility to the church. So while the church in itself, in and of itself, might be able to um, teach things in a, in a, in a certain sense, uh, fallibly, like when the church is using the ordinary mag magisterium, isn't intending to define anything in regards to faith and morals, uh, the, the church is able to err. You know, the, the church has the, the capacity to err. But God has chosen that in particular circumstances, the church is to be preserved from error by the power of the Holy Spirit in connection with Christ's promise about the Holy Spirit. And so the church isn't inherently infallible in everything the church does, but also the, the fact that there are sinners who are a part of the church does not negate the fact that the church can act infallibly by the power of God. The church still has authority. The Bible gives authority to a lot of other things apart from the Bible. The Bible says parents have authority over their children. The Bible says the government has authority over you. You hear that, libertarians? Yes, the Bible says to submit to the government, Romans 13. But it's not claiming that the government is infallible. Uh, the Bible says submit to your parents. It does not mean that your parents are infallible. It seems to me that he thinks the argument is... God has given authority to the church, therefore the church must be infallible. Uh, and, and while the the authority of the church definitely plays a role in our consideration of, of uh, ecclesial infallibility, that isn't like the reason. The reason why the church is given the charism of infallibility is because of the working of the Holy Spirit in the church. So uh, Jesus Christ promises that uh, not only will he be with them to the end of the age, but the, the, the Christ promises that he will send the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth and to also remind us of everything that uh, Christ has uh, taught us. So if the Holy Spirit is here to guide the church into all truth, then there has to be a sense in which the church is preserved from uh, acting against the truth or defining things contrary to, to the truth or causing people, uh, binding people's consciences to something that is uh, heretical, for example. The government clearly does make mistakes. Your parents can make mistakes. So just because God gives authority to something doesn't mean that thing is infallible. And in the Bible, God... And I'll just say, just because the church has the capacity generally to make mistakes, that doesn't mean that there aren't circumstances in which the church can't make mistakes by the promise of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. It gives authority to a lot of religious leaders, but that does not make them infallible. And this is a pattern that we see all throughout the scriptures, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God gives authority to Moses and Aaron, but Aaron sins and worships the golden calf, so that means Aaron was not infallible. God gives authority to the judges, but the judges regularly sin, go astray, and worship false gods. So that means the judges were not infallible. So I, I, I don't understand why he's equating infallibility with impeccability, and I think this is very explicit in Catholic theology that impeccability and infallibility are not related to each other. They, they, they don't. Uh, the, both, both of them, it's not necessary for both of them to be present uh, in order for uh, one of them to be true. And so um, impeccability just means the, the inability to sin. Just because you are able to sin doesn't mean you cannot act infallibly. 
Uh, and just it, it also, yeah, it, it, it still seems like he's thinking that um, uh, the, the argument is, oh, there's there's authority. God gives authority. Therefore, uh, the, the authority has to be infallible. That's not the argument. Uh, the argument is a lot more uh, complex than that. What in the world is this place? Okay. Oh, it's daytime already. All right. <laughs> well, I think we'll I think we'll keep uh, keep looking for buried treasure here. Then God gives authority to the kings, but the kings go astray and worship false gods. So that means the kings were not infallible. And every time one of these religious authorities, uh, keep in mind, God ordained religious authorities. Every time one of them goes astray, they constantly need to be corrected by the word of God spoken through the prophets. And when the prophets speak the word of God, yes, they are producing new revelation from God in a sense, but they're always drawing upon old revelation that was given to given to Moses. So, in the scriptures, we see religious authorities, all religious authorities, being called to submit to the word of God. Which yeah, so the the magisterium, which is the teaching office of the Catholic Church, which we affirm to be able to teach infallibly, and uh, the, the Pope himself also, who is, is capable of uh, giving an infallible teaching, uh, both of those uh, things, uh, the Pope and the magisterium, are subject to the word of God. They're not above the word of God. They can't contradict the word of God. However, they are authentic interpreters of the word of God as the teaching office of the church. And so because the church was uh, entrusted with uh, in, uh, guarding and preserving and correctly expounding the scriptures, the church is the correct or authentic interpreter of the scriptures. Which is what the scriptures are. The scriptures are the word of God the highest authority that basically norms all other religious authorities. So like I said, sola scriptura does not mean that we don't think the church has any authority. That's what Catholic and Orthodox straw men of Protestant beliefs are. They, Yeah, um, it, it, it depends. I, I understand what he's saying, um, but when it comes to uh, authorities and picking the authority that you will submit to, that is always um, qualified by so long as I agree with their scriptural interpretation. Uh, if you're born into a, uh, let's say, word of faith church, and uh, the, the mega pastor there is saying, you need to submit to me, you can't judge me, you can't judge my interpretation of scripture, um, because I am the Lord's anointed, and thou shall not touch the Lord's anointed, and all these, all these things, all these uh, erroneous uh, propositions. You rightly don't have to submit to them. Your pastor doesn't have some sort of intrinsic authority that he gets uh, by virtue of his calling from God. The, the authority that his um, teaching rests on is by his properly expounding the word of God. And so uh, the, the, the Protestant will say, well, you, you don't have authority over me in this instance. I don't have to listen to you in this instance because I think you're twisting the word of God. And so really it's, it's a contingent authority. It's insofar as I agree with you in your interpretation of scripture, I will listen to you and submit to you. But who are you really submitting to in that instance? Are you submitting to him as, as the person who's expounding the scripture to you, but erroneously in your opinion, or uh, are you, are you submitting to your own interpretation of the scriptures? And uh, uh, therefore you are choosing to submit in air quotes to anyone who agrees with you. Um, and so, Yes, while there are authorities, so to say, in Protestantism, those authorities don't objectively have authority from God. Those authorities have authority from God only insofar as they agree with your interpretation of the scriptures. And this doesn't only just go for pastors. This also goes for creeds and confessions and catechisms and uh, councils and all those all those documents and, and uh, magisterial works. Uh, those things don't intrinsically have authority over you because of their uh, nature, because of their source or origin uh, in, within the Protestant perspective. But uh, the, the church, within a Catholic perspective, 
objectively has authority to wield um, o- over over the church because the church is sent by God, given the authority by God himself, and because they are invested with authority and promised infallibility because of those two things, because they are the authentic, the one true church, therefore you must submit to them and in their interpretation of the scripture. You don't uh, come to submit to them only uh, until you are convinced of their position, they have a, a sort of divine right to your submission. They think we don't think the church has authority at all. So then they can just try and uh, point to a text like where Paul says the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. And we're like, yeah, we know that. We know the church has authority, but it's not a perfect authority. I'm making this video right after. It depends on what you mean by perfect authority. I feel like that's pretty vague, um, but... The, the idea that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth is, is based upon the idea that the church will always uphold the truth in every age, which is based upon the fact that the Holy Spirit is there to ensure that reality so that we aren't left with blind guides. Oh, there it is. Oh, oh, it's a spawner. Okay. Nice. We scored, guys. We scored. Let's let's continue the video. The whole, you know, all the drama with Pope Francis writing a statement that about same-sex unions, and it's not clear whether he's endorsing the union itself or just endorsing the, or, or just saying you can bless the individuals in the union. Okay. Yeah. So um, clearly, he hasn't read the document, and you know, I I don't fault him for having this um, faulty. Uh, to be frank, understanding of fiducia supplicants, but paragraph five is clear that the union is not blessed. Gosh, these zombies are so loud. Come on, guys. I'm trying to record a video. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. There's so many. How are they hitting me, dude? They shouldn't be. Oh, diamonds, let's go. So yeah, what was I saying? Oh yeah, uh, Fiducia Supplicans is clear that the union isn't blessed, and that's in accord with a 2020 decision by Pope Francis uh, that gay unions can't be blessed because God can't bless sin, and therefore the church can't bless sin. Um, so, uh, but but again, I don't fault him for his misunderstanding because uh, the, the mainstream media has definitely platformed this un- misunderstanding over and over and over again, no matter if it was a, a uh, Protestant or Catholic news media source. So I don't fault him for misunderstanding that. I uh, just wanted to clear that up because if you literally read to paragraph five, the first five paragraphs, you would understand that, yes, it's explicit, um, but people uh, people have free will and they can twist. <laughs> they can twist magisterial documents just like they can twist scripture. So. And, and a lot of people are freaking out over the idea that the Pope of the Catholic Church might have said something that's not in accordance with church teaching. Um, so I'm not saying Pope Francis did say the wrong thing or not, because I think the whole reason there's so much drama is it's not clear what Pope Francis was saying. No, <laughs> uh, the, the reason why there's so much drama is because it, while it was clear, many people twisted the document because they didn't read the document, and many people also twisted the document because it is, uh, it's helpful and beneficial for their uh, growing their audience and getting views. And so many people's channels and news sources um, are dependent on uh, creating outrage and, and, and making people upset so that the conversation continues to go, their article or video gets shared, and then they make more uh, AdSense <laughs> revenue and, and more, more subscribers because of that. And I think that's just uh, disingenuous and uh, frankly evil for causing so much strife within uh, the, the church. And it hurts our witness because of how much the Catholic Church and Pope Francis is being misrepresented. Now, I don't fault people for, for having difficulties with a document considering uh, the, the prevalency of uh, misinterpretations and miscommunications, but literally, if you just read paragraph five, it explicitly says the unions cannot be blessed. You don't bless the unions. <laughs> but if you're a Protestant like me, you don't have such an existential crisis when one of your leaders says something wrong or might have said something wrong. Because you don't have to accept it with the submission of intellect and will. Uh, that, that's the whole point. 
your church leaders, those Protestant church leaders don't have intrinsic authority. They have contingent authority, contingent on them accurately representing what the scriptures say. And by accurately representing what the scriptures say, I mean by uh, conforming to my interpretation of the scriptures. Because I'm in the PC USA, the Presbyterian Church USA, um, our leaders suck. Our leaders are heretics much of the time. They say a lot Facts. of theologically liberal <laughs> stuff. They seem way more invested in left-wing social justice. The material put out by the higher-ups in the denomination is basically just the 2024 Democratic platform. So because I'm a Oof. Protestant, I'm fine with criticizing my church leaders. I'm fine with the idea that my religious leaders could go astray and worship false gods because we see that happening all over the Bible. And the fact that they're doing that doesn't mean I have to split off and join a different denomination because no matter what... Yeah, so church leaders can go and leave the faith. It, it happens all the time. Priests apostatize uh b bishops schism from the church you know it it happens just because leaders can um fail and sin and and uh, speak fallibly doesn't mean that the church on occasion can speak infallibly you do no matter where you go religious leaders will always go astray because as protestants we believe the bible when it says that sin affects absolutely everything so yeah, the first reason why Again, the assertion that sin affects everything is a very vague, undefined claim that can be used and interpreted in any way the individual wants. So no offense to Redeem, redeem Zoomer here, but I think that's uh, too vague and can therefore be applied to whatever circumstance he wants. And so that's why the argument isn't that strong of an argument. By sola scriptura is true is that no institution, oh, no wow. religious leaders are free from sin, and not just sin in terms of moral actions, but sin having impacts on their credibility as a leader. All religious authorities can make mistakes, but God never makes mistakes. That's why the word of God must always be trusted above words of men. So that means I made a vi I made a video of Yeah, the word of God must be trusted above the word of men, but also God entrusted his word to an authentic interpreter, namely his church, who is the, the pillar and, and foundation of the truth, and who also the uh, Holy Spirit guides uh, uh, until the end of the age, and also who Jesus said he will be with until the end of the age. A couple episodes ago about ecumenical councils. Ecumenical councils are very useful in helping us understand the word of God, but there are some ecumenical councils where it's not, they are clearly departing from the word of God. And okay, <laughs> ecumenical councils are beneficial because they help us understand the word of God, but when I disagree with the ecumenical council, they don't. Okay, so the ecumenical councils are only uh, beneficial to help us understand the word of God when I agree with them. Therefore, ecumenical councils are aren't helpful because they're ecumenical councils. They're just helpful because I agree with them. So you, you see where the, the logic is running? As a Catholic, I say, when a council reaches an ecumenical status, then it is by virtue of it, of what it is, an ontologically, the, those things that it defines in matters of faith and morals are trustworthy. They, they must be assented to. Because they are ecumenical councils, they aren't ecumenical councils because they are trustworthy. They are trustworthy because they are ecumenical councils. Why do the bats look so weird? Did they, did they always look like this? And then we don't accept those. We accept ecumenical councils when they help clarify what the word of God means. And they're very useful for that. The Nicene Creed is almost a perfect litmus test for whether someone believes the gospel or not. Uh, and some people will say, oh, it's like, if you're not submitting to a church authority, how do you know which councils to accept and which councils to reject? Okay, if you're saying that, you're basically... They know which councils to re reject and which one to accept because they know which ones they agree with and they know which ones they disagree with. And so uh, the, the, the idea that the Nicene Creed, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, is a uh, litmus test for orthodoxy, not because of what it says, or not, not because what it is, but because I agree with what it says. So whenever you agree with a creed, then that becomes a litmus test for orthodoxy, not because the creed is trustworthy, 
in and of itself, but because you agree with the creed. Someone who denies the Trinity can just say, look, the Nicene Creed is is not infallible, and hey, look, it makes makes an error because it affirms uh, the... The, the Trinity, which we deny. And, and we know that the Trinity is wrong because my interpretation of Scripture, therefore we don't have to submit to the Creed or the Council of Nicaea because we disagree with, um, with uh, what, what they say and therefore they're not helpful for doctrine. Yeah, you, you see where, where the issues lie. Okay, if you're saying that, you're basically saying the councils are better at communicating than God himself through his own words. So I don't think you want to be saying that. No. What? How, how does that follow at all? Wait, let me listen to that again. Saying that, you're basically saying councils to accept and which councils to reject. Okay, if you're saying that, you're basically saying the councils are better at communicating than God himself through his own words. See, that, that's, just, that's just an ad hominem attack. That's not really substantive of, of any particular objection. If you think that you need to... If you think that you need to have an objective way of determining which councils to reject and which to accept, then you're saying that the councils are more tr- or, 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 or better articulating the faith than God? Well, first of all, the councils are based upon the word of God, which is handed down through both written and unwritten means. And so anything that the council says takes those things into consideration, and uh, anything that the council says is based upon what the word of God says, unwritten or written, and so God sufficiently communicates his word. However, when questions arise because of uh, certain applications and uh, questions throughout history, uh, such as the, the application of philosophical conclusions about God, such as uh, the immutability and the timelessness of God, when those questions arise throughout history, it is a fact that they were not asked at the time of uh, inscripturation uh, or or communication of uh, the deposit of faith. And so because those same questions were not asked, the, the, the Bible and sacred tradition does not most likely directly address them. And so um, when these issues come up, we take principles, we take conclusions from the deposit of faith, scripture and tradition, that necessarily imply a, uh, a certain answer to be made to objections and to questions. So to say that the, the councils are necessary to rightly understand the word of God uh, is saying that God uh, insufficiently communicated his word, misunderstands the nature of revelation within the Catholic perspective, because you don't need to ask every question and answer every question explicitly in the deposit of faith in order for for those principles to be uh, accurately applied by the church in other circumstances when those implications are drawn out, okay? But implications by their very nature are implicit. They are not explicit. So they need to be rightly communicated to the faithful for belief, hence the the necessity of ecumenical councils, which make explicit definitively those things that the the faith may not have been directly directed against, but which nonetheless follow from the truth propositions within the deposit of faith. And so I think this is is really just kind of an ad hominem. It doesn't follow that you think that God didn't communicate rightly if you hold to the necessity of ecumenical councils to clarify the faith. Because guess what? Protestants do that all the time. They don't think that their um, systematic theologies are uh, infallible, but they definitely see a, a need for them because the Bible isn't a formally sufficient rule to answer all the questions that we might have about the universe or about the nature of God. There are many things that are implicit that must be drawn out. And, and, there are many, and there are many philosophical conclusions that must be synthesized and correctly, correctly contextualized within the faith if we are to avoid heresy. That's why we use big words in the Nicene, oh gosh, I'm going to die, <laughs> in the Nicene Creed, like consubstantial with the Father. That word isn't used in Scripture, and Scripture doesn't necessarily... Um, 
address whether Jesus and the Father uh, share the exact same divine nature. Now, there are certain verses, such as the Father and I are one, uh, that would seem to indicate some level of unity between Jesus and the Father, but there are different ways of interpreting that that may be uh, more or less um persuasive to some people. And so because some people can be more or less persuaded by uh, certain arguments, there is a need for drawing out the correct interpretation and binding the faithful with the keys to the kingdom of heaven that are, are able to bind and loose, uh, which is which is a reference to teaching authority. There is a need to bind the faithful to the correct understanding so that the propagation of heresy is is stopped. Okay, next reason. Basically, all arguments against Sola Scriptura could have been used by the Pharisees to argue against Christ. Um, here is the biggest example of that. The number one argument against Sola Scriptura is the question of the canon, the canon of Scripture. Because as you guys know, as I... I would actually say the number one argument against Sola Scriptura is that Scripture teaches that traditions are to be held on to with the same sort of uh, reverence as uh, any other teaching in the apostles written or otherwise. And, and that's taught in 1 Thessalonians. Sorry, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. It's taught in 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold on to the traditions that we taught to you, whether by speech or by letter or whether by word of mouth or by epistle. And so uh, those things are to be held on to and, and firmly uh, uh, stood in because they are communicated by the apostles who are the instruments of God's revelation for the new covenant faith. And so anything the apostles taught in regards to faith and morals as to be held, whether they preached it or whether they wrote it, both of those things are to be used as the rule of the the supreme rule of faith because both are the word of god because they are instruments of god's revelation and so because scripture supports the notion of apostolic tradition or sacred tradition therefore scripture is false and that is that is one of the most uh, popular and 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 well thought out arguments against sola scriptura simply because it's biblical and patristic uh, you see saint irenaeus talking about uh, the the tradition of the apostles and, and how people err because uh, err in the faith because they don't accept the tradition of the apostles, um, and, and and they don't. Why why can he reach that far? Maybe it's because I'm in hardcore, but I feel like he shouldn't be able to reach that far. What the heck, dude? What in the world? I have no food. Maybe I should leave. Maybe I'm gonna leave. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's continue to hear what RZ says, and we're gonna we're gonna find some food. I think. As I hope you guys know. The Bible does not contain a table of contents in the beginning. It's not like uh, before Genesis 1, um, God says, okay, these are all the books that should be included in your Bible, so make sure you take a note of this. That's not what happened. There is no table of contents in the Bible. So how do we know which books belong in the Bible? So what the Catholic and Orthodox people will say is, oh yeah, you need to rely on church tradition to um, for your canon of scripture because church tradition assembled the Bible and gave you the Bible, so um, that means you must submit to our church because without our church, you wouldn't have your Bible that you love so much. Well, um, sort of. So the, the, the argument about the canon is basically this. How do you know which books rightly belong in the scriptures? Well, we know this because of the tradition handed down from the apostles. The canon, the canon of scripture, that is the right books that belong in the Bible, is contained within the tradition that the apostles handed down because it is... And I can't go up because it's dark. Awesome. And so it's it's not necessarily about well you have to submit to the church because sacred tradition. While that that is that is a conclusion that can be made. Like it's mostly an argument about where do you get the canon of scripture? Do you get the canon of scripture from a fallible source uh, or an infallible source? And the infallible source of the canon, at least in the Catholic tradition, is this another zombie spawner? You're oh my goodness, I almost died. 
So infallible source of the canon is sacred tradition. And the way that we come to know what belongs to sacred tradition is from the testimony of the church. That's what they say. And they are absolutely right that we depend on church tradition for the canon of scripture. However, that does not mean church tradition is infallible. God can use a fallible authority to deliver you an infallible document. Here's an example. Yes, so I, I technically agree that God can use a fallible authority to deliver an infallible document, but your confidence that that document is infallible is truncated by the idea that the authority is fallible. So if someone who is fallible says, here is an infallible document, he could be wrong about that, okay? Um, but if an infallible authority says, this here is an infallible document, then you are equipped to trust that infallible authority because they, in circum certain, certain circumstances, cannot err. There are a lot of zombies in here, and I hear a baby zombie, and baby zombies can like come through one, one block high uh, gaps, and so I, I, I don't, I don't want to die. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to continue listening, and the zombies are very loud, so I'm going to turn that down. And uh, let's go ahead and continue listening. God can use a fallible authority to deliver you an infallible document. Here's an example. Like, let's say you submit to a king, and the king has authority over you. The king's messengers don't have authority over you, but you could still trust the king's messengers to deliver you messages from the king. So, of course, God is the king, and the message that he is delivering is the Bible, and the messenger that is delivering that message is the church, church tradition. Another example is your pastor preaches the word of God to you. Your pastor delivers the Bible to you when he preaches the word of God to you. That does not mean your pastor has the same authority as the word of God just because he delivers the word of God to you. Yeah, so Catholics don't believe that the church has the same level of authority as God, but uh, the church has received authority from God. And if God has entrusted the church to um, authentically and uh, truthfully communicate, preserve, and explain his word, and he has given them the means to do so through uh, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, then the church on occasion can speak infallibly, at least trustworthily. And so before the church universally defined what the canon is, the church's judgment on the canon was still trustworthy and was still owed the submission of intellect and will because of the inherent authority that God has given the church and not the contingent authority uh, that Protestants think God gives the church. And so the church was to be trusted because it was the church, not because uh, the the faithful agreed with the church. But they'll still say, oh, there's a difference between normative authority and existential authority. Um, you still need to ha you still need to give a th a infallible authority to the church if you trust the church to produce an infallible document for you. But here's the thing. Jesus depended on the religious authorities, the religious traditions of his day for his canon of scripture. Jesus' canon of scripture was the Old Testament. So the Old Testament canon was not completely set in stone. The law was a set unit that people understood to be revealed by God because of the miracles associated with uh, Moses and stuff like that. Um, the the major prophets, that collection of writings that was understood to be revealed by God after a long pro process of canonization. But the, the complete Old Testament canon was not set in stone because at that time period, there was the Torah, there was the Nevi'im or the prophets, and the writings, that was not a complete set of uh, writings yet. It wasn't standardized just like the Torah or the prophets were. And that's why you see Jesus referring to the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms as a sort of threefold division, not because the Psalms make up the rest of scriptures that would uh, necessarily exclude certain books from scriptures that even Protestants understand to be canonical. Uh, no, the canonization process of the Old Testament was not finished until the church came onto the scene and the time of revelation 
ended at the at the death of the last apostle. So public revelation no longer occurs anymore. Therefore, the canonization was completed both with the rest of the Old Testament books, but also in the New Testament books. And so Jesus did not have a set canon, although he trusted the authority of the Sanhedrin of the Pharisees uh, that God has put that God put on earth to uh, to guide the people. And now the the idea of an infallible authority in the Old Testament is something that uh, people will speculate about, but I'll just point out that it, is, uh, it isn't comparable simply because the reason why the church is said to act with infallible authority on certain, in certain circumstances is because of the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Old Covenant, uh, the, the Holy Spirit was not given with this promise. The Holy Spirit came upon certain individuals to empower them, such as the judges and, and, and certain kings and, and people like that, but it, uh, the, the Holy Spirit... He was not sent during the Old Covenant time period to preserve the Old Covenant people in the truth. Uh, that just that, that was not uh, an active uh, role or promise of the Holy Spirit at that time period. As I said, uh, that is something that people speculate about. Uh, some people speculate that the Sanhedrin was capable of giving um, infallible uh, uh, teachings from God, such uh, and one of one of the examples is the Umin and Thumin, I think, or the Ur. Oh my goodness, this cave is huge. Uh, anyways, uh, one example that people give as a reason why the Old Covenant Sanhedrin was capable of rendering infallible decisions is because those decisions, which were ratified by God through the Umim and Thumim, I think I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, were said to be decisions from God. And so if they made decisions through those means the uh, and, and God rendered a decision through them, then those decisions have to be said to be infallible even though they're not revel- even though they're not revel- revelatory and even though um, the church can or the, the Sanhedrin could err in in certain circumstances. Uh, and so yeah, I, I think that that's why this uh, argument kind of misses the mark. And I've been recording for over an hour now, and we're only halfway through the video, so uh, I think that we're going to have to end it off here. If you guys do want me to continue this series, if you want to see more of uh, responding to Redeem Zoomer on uh, the catechesis world, uh, make sure to leave a like and let me know in the comment section below if this was helpful to you. Um, I know this is a, a far jump from what we usually post on this uh, on this YouTube channel, but I thought it would be a fun kind of detour before I get really serious again about responding to um, uh, Protestant arguments. I have two books that I have been working through. Um, I guess one book that has been uh, relatively recently, actually really recently uh, published, which is Why Do Protestants Convert? I've read that almost two times by now. I have a lot of notes that I kind of need to organize into a script so that I can adequately respond to it. Uh, it was written by Chris, Costali- uh, C- uh, Chris Costaldo, not Costalino, Chris Costaldo. And uh, I would really like to address his arguments because he's been platformed by Dr. Gavin Ortland and, uh, of course, um, Gospel Simplicity and a few other channels uh, to, to promote this new book that he authored with uh, Brad Littlejohn. And so I really want to respond to this because, hey, I was a Protestant and I converted, and I think that would be important for me to address uh, it, uh, some, of, some of the arguments, some of the claims that he makes, uh, how, how much we agree, how much we disagree. Uh, but I'm also going to be responding to um, a few arguments made in Big Bible difficulties uh, written by uh, Geisler and a few other authors um, because they do make a few anti-Catholic arguments that I would like to respond to. And uh, so those are the two things that I've been working on for a long time, as my patron members know. If you do like this video, make sure to give a thumbs up. If you want me to continue this, hey, let me know in the comment section below if uh, you want me to answer uh, the rest of the arguments that he makes in this video. Um, But yeah, this is a really chill, fun time. I never play video games anymore, especially not Minecraft. And so this was kind of a good uh, breath of fresh air, even though we were getting grilled by Redeem Zoomer. So I appreciate the work that he does on there. I think that he's really helping out um, uh, people taking their faith more seriously uh, and and fighting against liberalism. I think that is something that's noble about uh, the movement that he is uh, he's created. And so again, I appreciate you. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, Redeem Zoomer, if you made it to the end of this video, or if you even watch this video, I appreciate uh, your, your thoughts and uh, your 
contribution. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure to, again, leave a like, subscribe. Uh, we have the YouTube memberships going on. We have Patreon going on. And I would love your support. And so uh, thank you all to uh, my current patron members. I don't think we have any YouTube members right now. But thank you all for your support. And I hope that by my learning the faith, your faith will be strengthened as well. You have an amazing day and we'll see you guys next time. Peace.